Good morning. Thank you for coming. I know it's the second day of a conference, and it's early morning. Those two things make it really hard for people to show up and pay attention. So I appreciate you being here. First, I want to thank EduTech and the conference organizers and the sponsors for making this possible. We appreciate it. We realize without you, none of us would be here. So thank you. A couple of reminders. First of all, in the spirit of blended learning and flipped classroom, all the slides for this presentation are available on my blog at intdashboard.org. Secondly, there's a cheat sheet. So if you want the cheat sheet, it's up on the, uh, this part of the stage here, which will summarize the presentation. And the third bit is there's a feedback form. Like any good evidence-based educator, I'd love your feedback on the presentation. Last time I did this talk, they said, give us a cheat sheet. So now we have a cheat sheet. So if there's anything else you'd like to see in the talk, um, please provide that feedback for next time. The fourth thing, there will be a mentorship offer at the end. So I'll just leave that out there for now. So does anyone know where this is? Can anyone guess the country? There's a new president in that country? United States? Can anyone guess which state this is in? Kids with an H. It's an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Hawaii, that's right. This is Hawaii. Whoops. This is Hawaii, and this is a, an airport called Kalaupapa. It's on the northern island of Molokai. It's the site of a former leper colony. There was a Catholic priest called Damien, who actually now became a saint that ran a leper colony out there, and it's a fantastic place to land an airport. I'm also a, a private instrument commercial multi-engine seaplane pilot, and landing there has probably one of the greatest thrills and challenges of my life. So as pilots, we have what we call landing objectives. Now, when you're trying to achieve a landing objective, you need to know if you're too high or too low, too fast or too slow. And so pilots need real-time data to help them determine that, complicated instruments. Yet, to meet learning objectives, teachers also need to know, am I too high, too low, too fast, or too slow? And in many learning environments, they don't quite have that same level of data or real-time data that pilots do. It's one of the inspirations for why I'm here today. So, today's objectives, four of them. Number one is I'd like to explain who I am and why I'm here. Number two, I'd like to be able to define team-based learning. Number three, I'd like to be able to explain what it can do for students, teachers, and administrators. And finally, I'd like to be able to explain on how to implement team-based learning. So as Jane mentioned, I'm a team-based learning educator, enthusiast, and entrepreneur. So I teach three courses in aviation business at Embry-Riddle's campus here. It's the oldest and largest aeronautical university in the world. One is about airplanes, one's about airports, and one's about airlines. I'm also an enthusiast, so I give talks at conferences like this and also train faculty on how to do TBL. And finally, as Jane mentioned, I'm also an entrepreneur. So I worked as an entrepreneur in residence at Duke NUS Medical School here. For those of you who don't know NUS, National University of Singapore, the, one of the, the leading local university here. And along with the dean of the school, we invented a, a co-invented a pending patent, which we've commercialized into a new company. Now, how I got here, I started in Seattle on the West Coast, attended Columbia University in New York for engineering, worked in management consulting at A.T. Kearney in Chicago, then got a degree in finance from Duke, and then worked as an investment banker at Credit Suisse in New York, Chicago, and I moved to Singapore six years ago. Now, recently after I moved to Singapore, I switched and became Chief Financial Officer of SkyWest Airlines. We are listed on the London Stock Exchange, the Australian Stock Exchange, and Virgin made an offer for us, at which time I learned the number one rule of aviation business. Does anyone know what the number one rule of aviation business is? If somebody offers you money for an airline, you take it and you do something dramatically different. And that's what I did. When I was at SkyWest, we grew from 400 to 800 employees in under 18 months. Our biggest challenge was getting the right amount of talent for our team. However, I'd also been a career mentor as an alum to Columbia and Duke alumni, bright students for years. <coughs> Excuse me. And fortunately, I met many talented students that weren't able to achieve the job of their dreams. So that was the problem that I wanted to work on solving. And so the big question that I want to ask is, are students ready for the workplace? And so the three studies that I looked at, number one was business leaders. A Gallup poll suggested that 89% of business leaders don't believe students are ready for work. 
A McGraw-Hill education study of students themselves found that 79% of them don't think they're ready for the workplace. However, you look at academic chancellors and chief academic officers, according to Inside Higher Ed, 96% of them think students are ready for the workplace. Having been part of campus recruiting teams at AT Kearney, Credit Suisse, hiring employees at SkyWest, and now at my own company, I've reviewed over 10,000 resumes and interviewed hundreds of students. I will tell you, this gap is real. And it never became more clear to me than when I left as the CFO of an airline and started teaching at an aeronautical university. A great one. But what we needed students to do at the airline was different in how we were teaching and what we were teaching. I believe one of the biggest problems is that most learning environments are still dominated by lectures, and they don't work. Now, the irony of a lecture about the death of a lecture <laughs> is not lost on me. And so I'll try to keep it short, because I realize in about six minutes, you'll forget almost entirely everything <laughs> that I'm going to say. That's why we added the cheat sheet. But the retention rates are very low. The research on this has been well established for decades. If we look at today's environment for today's students, if you look at the millennial, quote, generation, they're interested in social and collaborative learning. They're interested in professors or teachers that are mentors, the so-called guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. They're looking for learning to be interesting. They want it real and relevant to the work, and they want immediate feedback. The lecture doesn't do any of this. You're not getting any of this right now in this learning environment. So having been to 10 of these conferences in the past year in the US, Australia, Asia, Latin America, the themes are very clear. And Lewis and Jane kind of referred to them before. There's a big shift towards active learning, blended learning, flipped classroom. I think most people acknowledge the lecture is dead. There's a realization that technology has a part to play. And finally, I don't know if anyone's shown the slide yet from the World Economic Forum. But every conference, somebody shows a slide on the World Economic Forum about the 10 skills needed in 2020. And the themes are very clear, and a lot of educators agree on them. Where it gets hard is how to actually do that and how to put that into action. OK, we talk about active learning and flipped classroom, but what do we actually do in the classroom? What are the things that we do instead? From a technology standpoint, there's 80,000 apps in education in the App Store. Which of the 80,000 do we pick? And finally, how do we align the world of work and the world of school to be closer together? I believe the team-based learning approach has enormous opportunity to help address these issues. <clears throat> so in the next eight to 10 minutes, I'll give you an indication on how to do that. So let's start by defining team-based learning, or TBL. It's a very specific form of blended learning, or flipped classroom. There's five basic steps. Before class, learn on your own with pre-work. In class, in a closed book portion, start with an individual test, then a team-based test, followed by a clarification session, and then followed up with team application cases. Now, what can this do for students? If we go back to those same World Economic Forum future skills, critical thinking, complex problem solving, people management, coordinating with others, judgment, decision making, none of them are developed in a traditional lecture environment. But six out of 10 in a team-based learning environment. I know Jane's asking a lot of questions about the US electorate. I believe that if there were more education like team-based learning, there'd be more complex problem solving, more critical thinking, more judgment and decision making, more opportunities for people in America. Second thing is what's in it, for, what, 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 what do teachers want and what do teachers care about? Many teachers want an evidence-based approach. How do I wade through those 80,000 apps? Many of them want to do a great job. They want feedback from their students, and they want a, a methodology that's supported by research. Well, team-based learning is that. TBL has been used over, for over 30 years in, in numerous academic disciplines, mostly in higher education. 40% of medical schools in the US now use team-based learning, including Columbia, Duke, Yale. One of the latest med schools in Singapore between uh, NTU and Imperial College in London uses team-based learning. So a lot of use cases 
in team-based learning. So it's very supported by research. One of the most amazing things that's blown me away. So anyone's looked at the ERIC Educational Research Database by the US Department of Education. Great resource to search on academic research articles and, and numerous sources. You'll find over 300 research articles on TBL. Well supported in research. And lastly, for administrators, one of the other things that we hear at conferences like this is increasing costs and funding pressures in the developing markets, but certainly in developed markets as well. So team-based learning can be enormously resource efficient. In the Duke NUS example here in Singapore, they will achieve better medical exam results in less than half the classroom time, which in the case of medical school can be materially important, is if you have less faculty time, they're enormously valuable and expensive professors because they could otherwise be in a hospital. In other countries like Vietnam, they're interested in adapting this in the medical schools there. They don't have enough medically trained doctors to serve the population, much less start to teach in the medical school. So this can be enormously valuable from a resource standpoint as well. So now we've kind of talked about here's what the issues are, here's the problem that we're trying to solve. We talked about possibly one approach that can do this. What I'd like to spend the next seven or eight minutes of going into is how actually to do this. And this is where the rubber really meets the road. So we'll talk about how to do TBL. So the first thing you want to start out with is backward design. Start with the end in mind. What do we want students to be able to do? For me, this is very easy to do in an aviation business classroom because I was just working in an airline. I knew exactly the type of questions we want students to address. Second thing is form like pre-work, and that could be readings or videos. And then the testing part, you could pull it from existing quizzes or examinations or midterms or finals. And the applications I found the easiest take real world problems and create those into an effective case. So let's go through step one is the pre-work. When I did this in the Aeronautical University, I used readings. There's a textbook. It was written by the Federal Aviation Administration. It's available for free on the FAA website. So I would literally just assign readings for people to do. Duke NUS. They actually do video lectures or voice annotated PowerPoint lectures. When we do this for corporates, they literally will send out just PowerPoint slide presentations. The trick with this one is it doesn't need to be hard. It just needs to be some form of pre-work or pre-content material. Duke has had experience with several million learners through its Coursera programs. And what they found is 80% of learners would rather download slides and read a transcript than watch a video. Most people can read about three times faster than they can listen. So don't worry about investing in the broadcast studio, getting mic'd up, the camera, the lighting. Don't worry about that. You can do this with just sending out readings and just um, assigning them or, or sending out your, even your existing lecture notes. Don't worry about the video component. The second bit is an individual readiness assurance test. So when students come to class, they take a quiz. It's done on their smartphone or tablet or laptop. And it's just a quiz to make sure that they did the pre-material or the pre-readings. Now what I do in this case is I'd use a very basic form of adaptive learning. So each week I give a quiz. About 75% of the questions are new material. 25% of the questions are old material. So I have a question whether or not do I use the old stuff, do I use the new stuff, do I use a random mix? As I thought about it, I realized that making the hard questions was most important. So if there's a hard concept, it's going to show up on the quiz each week until the class firmly understand it. A very basic form of adaptive learning. We don't need the machine learning, the neural networks, anything. We could literally just repeat the hard questions each week until students get it right. Now, while well, the students are taking the test, I'm looking at my teaching dashboard to find out what they're getting right and what they're getting wrong. So I'm mentally preparing myself as a faculty member for a just-in-time lecture based on how the students are performing. This is the type of real-time data that I'd want as a pilot to know where I need to adjust or change. Now in the next step, we do the same test but as a team. This is one of the more powerful parts to the pedagogy. Students repeat the same exact test but as a group. So I'm glad that we have the table set up this way. This would be a great setup for a team-based learning classroom. The five people at this table will then go around the t test, go through one, two, three, four, five, and say, I got A, you got B, what's the right answer? They defend the answer to each other, persuade each answer what the right is, develop those negotiation, problem-solving, and decision-making skills. Now when they do that, they enter the answer in, and they get immediate feedback. So if they get it right, they get a green check, move on to the next problem. 
If they get it wrong, red X, they have to re-debate for partial credit till they get the right answer. Immediate feedback is critically important. It'd be like practicing for a sporting event where if you went to the driving range, hit the golf ball, and didn't find out until two weeks later where it landed, you'd never learn from that. The immediate feedback is critical to improving performance. That's why I want the performance <laughs> feedback on my, my presentation this morning. But for students, if you, they get the wrong thing on a test and it doesn't get corrected, they'll remember the wrong thing forever. The immediate feedback is incredibly important. The other thing that's important about this as well is a very positive team dynamic. So in some teams, you might have a loud mouth that speaks a lot. Well, in one or two or three questions, the team may find out that the loud mouth isn't always right. Maybe we need to listen to the quiet person over here. It'll force the team to adjust and learn how to work better as a team. One of the other things I love about this is a resilience concept as well. So if the team gets a question wrong, they can't give up. The clock is ticking. Points are on the line. We got it wrong. OK, let's learn from it. What do we think the next answer is? Very powerful for resilience. In one of the talks I gave at the Edutech conference in Australia, the version of this conference in Brisbane, they were talking about how to stu prepare students for the workplace. And, and one of the most popular uh, topics was how not to be a dud in meetings. Well, I look at this process where there are points on the line, stakes on the line. We need to incorporate different viewpoints from people, and we do it under pressure. This is simulating a meeting. <laughs> if you did this 400 times in your university education, you would be really, really good at meetings. Now, on the faculty side, again, same type of real-time teaching dashboard information, so we know what students are, or what teams are getting right and what they're getting wrong. What we typically find is on an individual test, students will get about 70% right on their own. On a team-based test, teams will get about 90% right as a group. So then we're faced with the problem, what do we do for that last 10 or 15% that we can't, that haven't been addressed by students individually or as a group? Now, if I ask students if they don't understand, I will get basically a room like this. Does anyone have that problem? Nobody? Well, I'm having that problem right now. I got one person to respond. Um, huge issue. So nobody wants to admit they're wrong. I think in Asia, this is a big issue. It's a big issue globally, but here in this region, nobody wants to admit they're wrong. Everyone wants to save face. So what do we do? So I like to call this almost a form of teaching judo use the student's fear of failure against their fear of speaking in class. So what we do is to say, all right, as a team, identify what areas you're still confused on. So if you're team one and you're the gunners, you say, you know what, we understood everything. Team two says, you know what, we're confused on density altitude, very difficult concept. So say, all right, those gunners that said you understood everything, why don't you stand up and explain to the rest of the class and the confused team density altitude? Now, what that gives me as a faculty member is I get to understand, did the gunners really understand it for the right reasons? The confused team gets an explanation. But most importantly, there's a very strong incentive that if you don't understand, you had better identify that. So then I'll get students saying, we don't understand this, we don't understand that, we don't understand this, which is great for a teacher. What you want to do is focus your time on the things that people don't understand. So we use the valuable face-to-face -face class time focused on the hardest parts. Now that's the first half of class, and that really helps prepare students, perhaps from unequal levels, unequal preparation, to get them up to a same common base of knowledge. Now the second half of class is what I think is most real and most material for business, and we do team application cases. Open book, open note. Four principles. Number one, it's got to be a significant problem, a problem that really matters to what they'll do next. Number two, it's got to be the same problem, so we can have a rich debate among teams, Number three, specific choice. In medicine, the patient comes in. We need to amputate, we need to operate, we need to medicate or amputate. The patient's dying. We've got to make a decision. Business field, same way. We're flying from Sydney to Canberra. We need to decide which plane to put on it. We just can't list pros and cons. We need to commit to a decision. And the last bit is simultaneous reporting. We want everyone to report at the same time so they're committed to a decision publicly and forced to defend that answer in a public forum. So the way we do that, has anyone seen the game show Family Feud? It's kind of an American game show where they have a moment and they reveal the answer and the survey says. We do the same thing in class. <clears throat> so in this example, 
we'd have three teams that said ATR-72 turboprop, one team that said E-170 regional jet. Team four, you're on the hook. Why'd you say regional jet? Team two, why are they wrong? Had the students debate and teach each other. Very much moving the teacher from stage on the stage to guide on the side. Let them teach each other. This is the part, when I experienced it, I said, this will get teaching very close to the real world because the types of problems we want students to face are these problems. Which plane should we fly? I knew it because I worked at an airline. Our industry advisory council told us Embry Real students are great, but we really need them to understand why an airline will choose this plane on this route versus that route. That's what Boeing wants their employees to know. That's what Airbus wants their employees to know. Take the critical questions that your employers want or the next level of education wants and make them into application cases. So, in summary, I'm a team-based learning educator, enthusiast, entrepreneur. My focus is on the employability gap created by inefficient lectures. TBL is a specific form of flipped classroom that I believe can help students with six of 10 future-ready career skills. For teachers, it provides an evidence-based specific pedagogy that's used by half of med schools. And for administrators, it can be very resource efficient with better learning outcomes in less than half the time. How to TBL? Start with some pre-work, a closed book portion with an individual test, a team test, clarification approach, and finally, real-world applications. Now, moving forward beyond higher education, there are several corporates that have started using this approach in the pharma sector, Takeda, Pfizer, GSK, Johnson & Johnson. They saw the med schools doing this and said, gosh, if this is a great way to teach medical students, maybe we should teach our people the same way. Singapore's Public Utilities Board saw that NTU, Nanyang Technical University, started teaching engineers this way. They said, gosh, if it's a great way to teach engineers, maybe it's a great way to teach engineers after school as well. A couple K through 12 schools have started experimenting with this approach. We even had test prep companies for SAT and GMAT start to teach this way. And even we started teaching some career skills this way. I think it's a fantastic pedagogy. It works great. It will do amazing things. But I really think this is just the beginning. A typical course will generate 50 to 100,000 data points. Incredibly rich sources of data to optimize learning outcomes even further. Starting to look through and look at what are the right assessments, what are the right multiple choice questions, what's the discrimination index, what's the item analysis like, are we really get testing the right things? So this is really just the beginning. So I know people come to conferences, there's great ideas and great principles. I wanted to try to maybe have a different take by being very practical and step-by-step -step on how to apply things. Now I want to take it one step further and put out a mentorship offer. If anybody would like to try TBL, before the end of the year, I'm happy to mentor them, spend as much time as they need to help them do it. It can be a corporate context, HP, you love blended learning, great, why don't you try it? Um, K through 12, higher ed, happy to help anyone. Try one module. You can even do it as a review course. It doesn't need to be your core course content. Do it as a midterm review and a semester review. Experiment with it. Happy to help with that. Finally, um, we still have a few minutes for, uh, I think a few minutes for questions, um, which Jane will moderate. And then if you need the presentation, you can download it on my blog or just email me directly with any questions you have. A couple other housekeeping reminders. There's a cheat sheet on the side. So if you want to help remember this, and then there's also an evaluation form. If you could just fill those out or make those selves available to you if you like them. We'll turn it over to Jane. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, Team-based learning. Really interested in that point you were making about mentorship. So if we um, are keen to take up your offer, and that's a very generous one, how many hours would we need between now and the end of the year to do justice to one module? It's a great question. It depends on where your starting point. Uh -huh. So I think it could be done in a very short period of time, depending on how ambitious you want to be and what you have already. I think a lot of people have pre-work materials before. It could be very much as simple as sending out your lecture slides or assigning a couple readings. The hard part is generally the questions, coming up with the multiple choice questions for the test. One of most people find is that writing the questions easy, mm -hmm. coming up with the right answer is easy,
coming up with plausible wrong answers is hard. So it really, I think, comes down to the level of assessments that you have. Excellent. I'm sure there are people out there that are going to take up that offer. Any questions? Yes, could we get a mic over to the middle of the room? Thank you. Could you just say your name and where you're from so we have a little bit of context? That would be great. Hi, good morning. I'm Sharon. I'm from Singapore Polytechnic. I would like to question about the group dynamics. Do they self-organize or do you assign and do they change from week to week? Thank you. That's a great question, um, and it's one that comes up, and when we actually do these workshops, we always do a, a quiz question on this. So if I were to do this talk with a version of a quiz in it, I would actually quiz that same question. In terms of teams, I think we found that the best teams are teams that are complementary skill sets. So that's generally one where a faculty member will select those teams. So what I typically do is ask for my students' resumes or their CVs or their background. I've even started ask them priming questions. Um, or almost baseline questions at the beginning of a course to try to find the optimal mix of a team with different skill sets. From a team size standpoint, excuse me, uh, typical team size would be five to seven is pretty good for, for a semester long course. And I also think keeping the teams the same adds a lot of value because in many work settings, you're not gonna be able to get, pick your team. So you're gonna need to have to learn how to work with a different group of people. Another question? I think I saw somebody else's hand up. Okay, perhaps while oh, there's that back, person... back left. Sorry? No, I think it's a back left. Yes, okay. Excellent. I knew I detected another... The movement, yeah, you can see the movement out there. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Thank you for sharing. I'm Bixia from Tomasic Polytechnic. Uh, we run a couple of subjects with the flipped classroom approach. Just would like to ask, um, is there anything that you try to enforce to, because flipped classroom or team-based learning require them to learn at home before they attend the class. So do you, is there anything that you would do um, to, to encourage them to learn, or what would you do if they do not do the pre-learning at home? It's a great question. So an important element is that students come into class prepared. So what I've generally found is that the individual test at the start of class has an important impact to encourage people to come prepared. Then the second level on that is the team-based test has a social effect. So that if I come to the team-based test and I'm not prepared, I've kind of let down my three or four other teammates and we don't perform as well as a team. So I find the individual tests, the team-based test matters. In an academic context, what some people do is they will actually also have a peer evaluation process midway through the course and at the end of the course where five or ten percent of somebody's grade will be voted on or graded or decided by their teammates based on how well, how much of a contribution they made to the team. So those are three approaches that people can use to help ensure that people do the pre-work before in academic context. Now, we've also tried this in continuing medical ed education with doctors. I will tell you, doctors do not do pre-work. <laughs> they just show up. So we've had to modify this format a little bit to give a little bit of a short mini lecture at the beginning and then go through the same individual tests, team-based tests, and application cases. Excellent. We have time for just one more question. Top of mind? No, okay. It was so comprehensive. Thank Absolutely, you. indeed. And what's really interesting is that UTS, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Shirley Alexander, we only, there are only three collective learning spaces in about a $1.2 billion building program. So we've actually offered, opted to move right away from the lecture theater. So team-based learning. And what I love about what you've talked about is this idea that to work in a team, it has to be highly structured. And I think that's very appealing in the context of project-based learning, problem-based learning, and where we want to shift both school and practice in universities. So thank you so much, Brian. Thank that you, was Jane. wonderful. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Yep.